Uh, hello? Hello? Are, are you speaking? Oh, okay. Sorry, because I wasn't hearing anything. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We got a little thing that it was recording. I don't know if that... Uh, is it better if I sit over here? I think we are fine. We can see you and we can see the slides. We can hear you. Thank you. Okay. The owl was being annoying as usual. Okay. So these are the objectives that come from the neonatal perinatal medicine training objectives because um, historically the fellows used to take um, epi epidemiology. And so uh, did you guys take epidemiology? Yeah. So, oh, so you're going to know some of this. It came and left, yeah. And I, and I think the whole epidemiology course can be a little bit much, but uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some of, about social determinants of health and some just about um, a little bit of perinatal epidemiology, because I think it's important that we kind of understand the context with, within which we send babies out into the world. So the first question, and the three of you in the room gets to answer. And I'm going to open it on my Dropbox so that I get the right answer. Is what is the population of Canada? Forty-eight million. Oh, Are you sure? Almost, yeah. It's not sixty-five million. <laughs> between thirty-six and forty-eight, and I will go with forty-eight. Come on, you want to take a guess? I would. I would say C. Yeah, so it's actually C. Um, the population of Canada is about 36, almost 37 million, which I think for those of you who, um, sorry, I'm just opening so that I have my answers. They come from larger centers that probably have bigger populations than that in a substantially smaller area. That is the population of Canada from 2021. What is the population of Manitoba? I know Winnipeg has around 800,000. So if you add everybody else to it, maybe uh, A or B, but A or B. <laughs> Yeah. Is, is this included in the citizenship exam? <laughs> <laughs> it probably <laughs> is included in the citizenship exam. <laughs> yeah, it is B. So it's just over it's just over one million one million three hundred thousand. So we're not a very large population and we're spread over but we're spread over, right? We're most and right as Hamam said, like a pop, like three quarters of that population lives in Man lives in Winnipeg, right? So, but we provide a lot of health care, right? We provide health care to Manitoba, and then we also provide health care to the Kabbalic region of Nunavut and Northwestern Ontario. So our catchment area is bigger than that. And again, spread over a gigantic geographic area. Before COVID, because COVID threw a wrench into some things. How many babies approximately a year are born in Manitoba? Eight. Five million in HSC? Uh, five thousand. Five million? Only, uh, only when you're no, on no, call, it feels like five million. Five thousand in HSC and three thousand in, in uh, yeah. some bonuses, so this make eight, and the rest are eight. So we go with the smallest number. That's what I will remember in the statistics of the last year of HSC. Five thousand deliveries. We're about equal right now, they'd be in HSC. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> so before COVID, it was actually C. About 17,000 babies are born a year in Manitoba. So there's more babies born outside of Winnipeg than we think, right? If you, but if you, think, if you think about it, when you go for transport, like Thompson, the Paw, Boundary Trails has a very high birth rate, right? There are a lot of babies born in, in smaller centers. Historic, like 20 years ago, there were even more little centers that did deliveries. Um, but you know, part of providing safe maternity care is you know delivering more than two babies a year. 
So they did consolidate a whole bunch of, uh, of the deliveries uh, into, still into the rural centers, but into kind of a center area. Steinbeck does a decent number of deliveries. Selford does a decent number of deliveries. So there's more deliveries that happen outside of our center than we think. What happened with COVID? More births? What's your guess? Mm. For me, I would say the same number, certainly. Yeah, yeah. More, more people have more time on their hands. <laughs> well, they did have more time on their hands, but the birth rate actually fell quite a bit during COVID. So it fell about 2,000 in Manitoba over the over COVID. So it's down about 15,000, and it's starting to increase again. But yeah, there was there was actually quite a substantial drop in the birth rate during COVID, which you think people would be like, you know, at home, but no, but they. Sure yeah, I, I think I think there was enough uncertainty. Okay. So what is Manitoba's live birth rate? And while we're trying to guess, it's your live birth rate is what's the denominator in a live in live births? When we when, like live birth rate is a statistical term, right? So what's the denominator? Per thousand what? Child bearing. That was for the mortality and infant mortality. So I don't know. Because you know, we are speaking about describing the live birth, so it will be the total deliveries, including stillbirths. At, uh, I mean, I don't know if we include abortions. But... Well, this is the this is the live birth rate. So I hope it's not. If the denominator was total births, then that'd be a really large number of stillbirths, right? Yeah. So what's per thousand what? Uh, the population. Population. It's just population. So, yeah. It's not women. It's not women of childbearing age. It's just population. So which is, what is it? So now you got to try to do some math. <laughs> yeah. And this is pre-COVID because, of course, it went down with COVID. I would go with the seven per thousand, seven more than one per thousand. Uh, because I was calculating almost like 17,000 divided by <laughs> 1, 300,000, so it would be more. So it's actually 12.4 okay. per thousand. And just the important thing here is that just from a, like when you read a live birth rate, it's just to know that the denominator is population. What is Nunavut's live birth rate? Hey, can you come to join us? Yeah. We are 12. So I missed your number. What was our live birth? It should be higher. It's 12. It's just over 12 okay. per thousand. I was hoping it was a higher number. I will go with the 20 for this. It should be higher. 20. It is higher. Twenty. 20. Ismail thinks 20. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually 25.6 per thousand. Really? Yes. So the birth rate in Nunavut is quite high. But remember, the population of Nunavut is not very high. So that's how come it seems like there's not as many babies coming from Nunavut. But when you adjust for the population, the birth rate is quite high. Why is the birth rate so much higher in Nunavut than it is in Manitoba? This is live birth rate. Can't wait for the answer. I, I don't know. It could be just the cultural things about. Right. It. So some of it is cultural, right? Some of it is cultural practice around contraception, yeah. cultural practice around young age at childbirth, right? So yeah. in in traditional Inuit culture, there's not a lot of use of contraception, and in many of the indigenous cultures, there's not a lot of use of contraception, and there's a much more open acceptance of uh, having children outside of committed relationships uh, or there's in committed relationships but not necessarily in marriage and there's a substantially better acceptance and kind of normalcy of having children in your teenage years um, and so right and then the Inuit the Inuit populations have uh, custom adoption right so if you have a child if you're pregnant and you're not you know you're you're not ready or you know you're you, you don't you don't want to raise that child then there's a lot of open adoptions into other families 
So yeah, so, and then also the other problem is, is that historically it's getting better now, but it's very hard. It's, it's the healthcare delivery in the North is also not ideal, right? So access to things like contraception, if you want it, long acting contraception, you know, if you want to have a tubal ligation or a vasectomy, you need to come down to other larger centers. Culturally, they're not accepted as much. So like, even if you want to, then like you, maybe you don't like everybody knows where you're going for your health care, right? Like, so it's in smaller communities, sometimes reproductive health care is, some, it can be difficult to access, especially if you're accessing reproductive health care that may not be the norm in your community, right? You don't, you know, if, if everybody in, in, if you go into the hospital to have a tubal ligation or have a vasectomy and the nurse is your neighbor from down the street, right? It's very hard, it's very hard to have any sort of privacy in small centers. So that certainly affects practices around reproductive health care. Is there also the fear of like from residential schools and that kind of thing of like how people were treated there, like where they were, you know, forced sterilization? I mean, we support sterilization. We st forced and coercive sterilization is certainly still going on. Um, and, and I think that we have to, like I think, think that we have to acknowledge that, um, yeah, that just like the ability to trust your healthcare providers is new. And well, hopefully, hopefully getting better. But yeah, like, I mean, the effects of, of colonization and systemic racism on healthcare in general are, you know, worse than we want them to be. And the, yeah, and reproductive healthcare gets even dodgier, right? Because again, it's reproductive healthcare is an area where we're still fighting historical norms as to what is appropriate healthcare. Like only, like the best way to reduce unwanted teenage pregnancy is long acting reversible contraception. And until very recently, even the Canadian Pediatric Society didn't recommend, didn't recommend it as their first line contraception for teenagers because there was historically outdated ideas about it increasing your risk for STDBIs and the use of like the use of IUDs in people who haven't ever had a baby, right? And like these are, this is how you reduce unwanted pregnancy, right? You give somebody a contraceptive agent that they don't have to think about for five years, right? Not something that, I mean, a teenager can barely get themselves to school. They're not gonna remember to take a pill every day, right? They're not gonna, they're not gonna use a condom every time they you know, want to. And then the other thing is, is that those are very, right? And again, if you're in a, if, if it's youth, Right, like there's a balance between um, cultural acceptance uh, and kind of normalcy of having your children when you're young. But if you don't want to have children when you're young, like you need the opportunity to do that as well. And so, right, and it's and it's a balance. So I think all of those things come into play as to why the birth rate in movement is higher. Okay, what's the total fertility rate? Yeah, B. Uh, B is my lucky number. My lucky number. So B is the general fertility rate. And D is the total fertility rate. So the total fertility rate is when you read like, there's 2.3 kids per family, right? Like that's, that's, the, that's the total fertility rate. And so Manitoba's is just under two. It's 1.96. And Nunavut's is almost three, right? So it just tells you, it, it, it's just again, this idea about, I mean, it's, it's really a construct, right? But it's just kind of meant to give you a general idea about family size and how many um, how many births uh, somebody's going to, uh, a person, and these are all historical because they talk about women, and so, I mean, it'll be interesting to see if stats ever catches up to this idea that, you know, not only women can have babies, but for now, we're calling them women, um, but that's, yeah, that's kind of where we are, and then the other thing that it's important to remember is that there's a difference between births and pregnancies, right, so there's there's your, your pregnancy rate is always going to be higher than your birth rate, which is going to be higher than your live birth rate, right? And so because there's there's losses along the way, there's miscarriages, there's elective terminations and all of the things. 
What's your infant mortality rate? This one's an easy one. It's the infant mortality. How do we define the infant mortality? Well, it's under one year old. Under yeah. one year old, and it's to the. It should be to total life births. Yeah. So your infant mortality rate, right? Death under one year over total live births. Because you have to be at risk of dying, right? So you have to be born alive. What percentage of infant mortality is neonatal mortality? So neonatal mortality is what? Yeah, that's before 28 days. Deaths under 28 days. So what percentage of infant mortality is in Canada is neonatal? 55%. I want to say A. I was like, what's the percent? It's actually 75%. Oh, in the developed in the in developed countries, most infant mortality is neonatal mortality. Right. Okay, so this isn't like oh, Canadian. This yeah. is worldwide. This is not worldwide because worldwide everything looks very different. I see. Yeah, this is in Canada. Oh yeah, states. Yeah, so I don't know if you want to revive. I did say in Canada. Yeah. So, oh, so I'm, all the oh, infants yeah. that died, 75% are neonates. Okay. Correct. Makes, oh, makes yeah. sense. Now. Okay, makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Most infant, like most kids that die under one year of age, die in the first month of life. Yeah. Okay. And again, we're a little bit. I mean, most and like most babies that die in the NICU die relatively early in their state, right? Mm -hmm. But you remember the ones that die later, and then we have no exposure to. We don't have that much exposure to. I mean, technically, some of our kids will be post neonatal mortality, right? Because they live past 28, because this doesn't, doesn't adjust for your gestational age. But again, our babies are a tiny little tip of the iceberg. And we have a skewed picture of what it looks like, right? Because we don't see the healthy ones, we see the sick ones. Yeah. So then, how many of those die in the first seven days? That's early neonatal mortality. Half of the 75. So half of them, they will die in the first week, and the, the next half will die in the first So you're saying 40%? Percent, percent? No, this is the same one. It did not change the slide. It did not change the slide. <laughs> <laughs> so half of 75. Yeah, half of the 75 will die in the first week, and the next half will die in the first. And the next, uh, so about 80% of neonatal deaths, or half of infant deaths, happen in the first week. Mm -hmm. So. And I mean, we know that, right? So yeah. of our, many of our babies die in the first week. But when you hear that number, though, it's just like, oh, right? Like, it's just so sad. But then this also includes babies that are, like, incompatible with, like, well, yeah. 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 Right. the fact that, like, and mom carried to that far, and then I won't be going home with anyone. Yeah. 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 Post-neonatal mortality in Canada. In, and this is in the world, or in Canada, because it's all the same. So death after the first 28 days is most affected by what? The title of this presentation. Correct. So that, I mean, that's a really, really important, important thing to realize, is that death after the first month of life is most affected by so the social determinants of health. It's not, I mean, it's affected by access to medical care and it's affected by gestational age and it's affected by maternal health. But the biggest impact on deaths after a month of age is, are the social determinants of health. Um, the social determinants of health affect, um, affect neonatal mortality, but they mostly affect neonatal mortality by putting you in the nursery, right? Like, the social deter once a baby is in the nursery, their social determinants of health don't play into like a 25 weeker, whether they come from poverty or, or richness, once they're in the nursery, their chance of survival is the same, right? But their chance of getting into the nursery is affected by their social determinants of health. And then we're going to talk a little bit about after they leave the nursery, how they do is affected by their social determinants of health. But medical quality of medical care and all the things that go into it certainly are play most bearing on your neonatal mortality okay what gestational age birth weight is the lower limit for recording a live birth let's just understand the question so for something to be considered a live birth are there criteria 
for calling something a live birth? Besides the fact that it has to be born alive. There is no. Yeah, there, is, there should be a heart rate or breathing. Right, okay, but if it's, if it's got a heart rate or is breathing. Even when we use I would say not. Well, it shouldn't, okay, so I don't, I don't, I don't know. There's What's no the, problem. what does the, the Kai Hai who, who, who gathered and, and stats can gather all of our statistics. Sorry, I'm just okay. Does this depend on age of pregnancy? Which we determine by based on our sources. I mean, and our let's say outcomes and statistics. But if a parent through twenty weeks, oh, like 20, 20 because uh, I want to, like I don't know. What if I, I what if I insist as a father and the mother? Let's give them the chance. You have all the advances. I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about offering resuscitation. Yeah. I'm saying. I'm saying if a an infant delivers at twenty weeks with a heart rate. Is that is that recorded as a live birth? Yes. So, so delivery versus miscarriage. Right? right. Is it a miscarriage or is it considered a live birth? Twenty-four weeks is what I studied in medical yeah, school. Yeah, I was like twenty-four weeks. weeks because thirty weeks are about twenty-three weeks. We are just saying it was that like our life. Yeah, it would be a lot. I'm not talking about doing anything. I'm talking yes. about do you need to record it as a live birth? Oh, that's a good question. You guys reported as a live birth. Yeah, <laughs> and passed away after 30 minutes, after 60 minutes. Yeah, yeah. do you have to record it as a live birth? Do you have to fill out the paperwork for it being a live birth? Yes, yes, So, yes, there's no criteria to call something a live There's no gestational age or weight criteria to call something a live birth. Okay. If it's born with a heart rate, it's a live birth. Okay. Is the converse true though? If a 20, if a 20 weeker is born without a heart rate, is that count as a stillbirth? Or does that count as a miscarriage? I think it's a miscarriage. If you have an evidence that antenatally was a, there was a fetal heart rate, that would be like yeah, miscarriage. Uh, uh, yeah. But if antenatally we don't have any evidence of the heart rate, I would say it's a still This is great interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and this is statistics. And so yeah, this is yeah. why this this yeah. this quibbling about is it a live birth or is it a stillbirth or is it a miscarriage is one of the reasons why stillbirth rates and live birth rates vary between centers because when you're talking about small numbers, you know they, they do add up over time. And so whether you record um, uh, sorry, I'm really trying to book a meeting about um, COVID visitation. So yeah, so to record something as a stillbirth, it has to be above 20 weeks or above 500 grams. Okay. But it can be a live birth at any gestation. So it's basically what we're saying, what will resuscitate them, really. Is no, no, it's completely separate from, re from the limits of viability and resuscitation. Okay. This is, this is just for statistics. And the thing is, the other thing is that this hasn't, this definition hasn't been um, changed in quite some time. Oh, really? Right? So, because as soon as we change the definition, our rates won't be comparable to historical rates, right? This is just for statistics. This is just so I know what someone's stillbirth rate is, and I can just I can discriminate it from a miscarriage, because at some gestational age it's a miscarriage, and at some gestational age it's a so stillbirth. So you said over 21 weeks. Over tw over 20 weeks, or over 500 grams. If the fetus is over 500 grams and it's and it's stillborn, it's a st it's considered statistically a stillbirth. So notice to use the word or, not and. So either or. or. And this doesn't actually, this is actually the obstetricians that deal mostly in yeah. this, right? Yeah. Like once I got called down to the to triage to look at a, a fetus, a delivered, a stillborn fetus, to help the obstetrician decide if it was a stillbirth or a miscarriage. Yeah. Okay, what is Manitoba's infant mortality rate in 2015? Three per 1,000 years. It's the only one complete sentence. <laughs> <laughs> oh 
Yeah, I'm good at exam tricks. <laughs> <laughs> I like that answer because it's the lowest one. But. Yeah, <laughs> that's another characteristic one. So it's actually 6.7. Yeah. It's B. B. Yeah. And Canada's infant mortality rate is 4.5. So does that have to do with our size? Our no, because it's because it's adjusted for live, it's per thousand live births. It has to do with um, partially with the fact that we have one of the highest child poverty rates in exactly. Canada. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Probably the, one of the maybe one of the big reasons. Yeah. But yeah, so it's higher than the national average. How does the infant mortality rate in the Northern Health region compare to the Manitoba rate? Double. Triple. Yeah, so it's actually double. So our infant mortality rate is already high, and in the north it's double. Right? Primary and primarily made up in, right? And again, so remember how I said you can the infant mortality rate is birth to one year, right? So once you're in the nursery, your mortality rate is the same, but you're more likely to end up in the nursery if you if you come from poor socio socio demographics. And uh, so, yeah, so babies from the north are more likely to end up in the nursery, and then they are more likely to, once they go home, they're more likely to die as well. And then the other important thing that when we talk about social determinants of health is it's important that we talk about the fact that cultural group or race are not a social determinant or are a determinant of health, but they're not they're, they they themselves are not necessarily um, intrinsically a determinant of health. Like whether you're from the Middle East, you're from Canada originally, you're indigenous, that in and of itself shouldn't affect your health and your survival. But what happens is we have systemic racism, and then ongoing poverty and then racialized groups tend to be disproportionately overrepresented as, as living in poverty. And so that, that is, that's how it works through, right? So it's not, so this slide shows us that, so this is from a recent report on First Nations health in Manitoba. And so this compares uh, all other Manitobans to registered First Nations individuals. And so it shows you so this is for, this is by income quintile. So if we even if we compare um, First Nations individuals to the lowest urban and the lowest rural income quintile, we can see that their outcomes are worse. Their infant mortality rates are higher. So it's not just that First Nations folks are more likely to live in poverty than other folks in Manitoba. It's that there are factors additional to that that are affecting their, affecting their survival. And so it's important, and then we can see, right? We said, I said Manitoba's rate, right? So our highest rural, our, in our highest urban, the infant mortality rate is about three, right? But then urban off reserve, it's even four. So like even First Nations individuals living in Winnipeg are almost twice as likely to have an infant mortality have an infant death than First Nations folks, the non-First Nations folks, or all other Manitobans. The all other Manitobans includes other Indigenous groups um, and non-registered, so self and self-identifying First Nations folks that aren't registered. But again, you know that's that also includes other folks that are overrepresented in poverty. So it just it just again shines a very glaring light on the fact that we have a significant discrepancy in outcomes for folks, even folks living in Winnipeg. And again, so this is a, this is an older slide because we haven't run this data in a while. So this is um, infant mortality rates. It, so this is back in 2008, right? So it's it's or up to 2005. And so the dark black line is 2001 to 2005. The other thing is it's not like these rates have changed much. Um, and it shows you that like even in Winnipeg we have a significant discrepancy. So it's not that folks can't access healthcare 
or that folks can't, you know, get to a hospital. Point Douglas is like right across the street, right? And so it just shows you again that infant mortality doesn't really have anything to do with access to healthcare. It has to do with poverty. Okay, there's kind of other social determinants of health. And so, I mean, that's important when we talk to families, right? Like we really have to realize that, you know, we don't know the circumstances that families come from. We shouldn't assume the circumstances that families come from. But when we do things like talk about buying bottles and talk about buying baby stuff and talk, right, and talk about having access to, you know, we talk about social isolation as well and like talking about having the ability, like why don't folks access prenatal care? Well, part sometimes it's because they can't get to their prenatal care. They have no one, right, especially with COVID, you couldn't bring anybody with you into your doctor's appointments. Now we have families who can, the reason I keep being on the phone trying to vote, trying to fix something is that at St. D, we're still not letting kids into the nursery. So your mom with a two-year-old can't come into the nursery to see your baby because she doesn't have anyone to look after her two-year-old, right? And just so we, we, and COVID has been extra hard on a lot of this because a lot of the informal supports that we rely on have been removed. So it's just, it's, it's, we certainly shouldn't assume, and it's important to check our bias and that we're not assuming that a family that comes from up north is necessarily living in poverty, but we also shouldn't assume that a family living up north has access to the same kinds of things, especially if you, I mean, you guys have flown on transport, so you've been to reserves, right? But until you've seen the, you know, you've seen how, you know, much of Manitoba lives, it's, we just have to kind of think about all of that and making sure that we spend a little bit of time to get to know families when we're talking about, you know, when we're doing a consult at 22 weeks or when we're talking to a family about going home. Um, many families that, you know, that come from circumstances that we're not aware of, you know, they may be, they may be living in poor socio-demographics, but in some communities, they do have a richer community support network, right? So it's all, it's, it's just, you know, it's not, it's not what we're used to. So it's important that we, that we kind of know this information when we're talking to families. So what percentage of new moms in Manitoba have less than a grade 12 education? 18%. It's about 18%. Good job. And some of that, and some of that will be because they haven't yet had a chance to graduate from high school because they are not yet old enough to graduate from high school. But some of it is that they haven't graduated from high school. And we're again above the Canadian average. In Canada, it's about thirteen percent. In the Northern Health Region, it's about thirty percent. No, I know this is way fantastic. Manitoba has a small poverty problem. What yeah. percentage of the Northern area served by Manitoba? or is under Manitoba's catchment area? I'm talking about the Northern Health region, which is Manitoba. Okay. Like the north of Manitoba. I mean, when you look at all the whole north, like north, near the north pole, Nunavut, like what, what? Well, we cover about a third of Nunavut, I mean, area-wise. What other province serves up north? That would be interesting so, to compare to that, you know, as opposed to- Well, this, this northern is just northern Manitoba, it's 30%. Okay. Oh, it, it's the same across the whole north. Yeah, because we have the same problem. Yeah, because again, because it's not necessarily about like the Calloway, right? The capital of Nunavut has a level two nursery in it, has a pediatrician. Like they have, they send their kids to Ottawa, but like they have better access to healthcare than um, like uh, Rankin Inlet, right? Who sends all their babies down to us, but you know. It's the distance that we travel. Right? Yeah, it, it, a lot. So some of the problems in the north, like some of the healthcare delivery problems in the north are distance and access and right. Like you, you can't. But again, once we're talking about once we're talking about post neonatal, right. Some, yes, yeah, some of the higher neonatal mortality is because those kiddos are more likely to be outborn or more like right, less likely to make it down here in time. But the thing is that we have a very skewed view of that because we are a very, like we have a very small window on that. Once you're outside of the neonatal realm, it's things like safe places to play, 
you know, clean what clean running water, <laughs> heat that isn't a stove, right? Not living with 15 people in your house. Like it really is. Two bedroom homes. Yeah, 15 people in your house that's as big as this room that doesn't that has wood stove heat. Like that's how come, right? That's how come big kids, there's a reason we vaccinate kids that with synergists term babies that go up north, right? Because they're at higher risk of respiratory morbidity because of the living, because of the circumstances they live in and the, and because if they get sick, it's that much further of an evac, right? But it's, it's just, it's a different world. <laughs> and, you know, the, the answers to those, the, the answers to that are empowering the local communities. Because again, if we roll in, and try to, right, like that's how they've been trying to fix the water problems is like the white folk have been rolling in and trying to put in these high-end water filtration systems that nobody knows how to fix. They work for a year and then they break, right? And whereas if you if you give the money and you give the tools to the communities themselves, they can figure out an answer that works for their community that's sustainable. So, and it's also the same with there's, there's, there's a trade-off Right, so there's there's there used to be a pol there's there there is a there was a policy called the out for confinement policy where all First Nations folks women living on reserve were evacuated to a birthing center at like 36 weeks regardless and so right which is in some ways you understand it because you want to have a baby in a center that is capable of looking after a baby if that baby has complications, but you're also removing folks from their home and their community for four weeks, right? Yeah. Forcing them to have their children away from their community. And the way to, and, and we're judging the risk of that, right? Like we, uh, folks in Winnipeg can make a choice to have a home birth, an attended home birth, or a, you know, an out of hospital birth, with, and there are intended risks to that that you don't have inside the, I mean, there's benefits, but there's also risk. Um, and so, you know, historically we, the government removed that choice. And so again, part of that is like returning birth to home communities. And some of that is a balance, right? Like if you have, you can choose to have a baby in a center that doesn't do cesarean sections. And if your child needs an emergency cesarean section, they need to be evacuated to somewhere that can do an emergency cesarean section. And that has an intended risk, but for some people, the importance of having their babies close to home. So just like, we just think about all these things that play into, you know, the way we provide healthcare in, in Canada. And so, yes. And so maternal education is one of the strongest um, links to uh, long-term outcome, long-term neurodevelop neurodevelopmental outcome, educational outcomes, uh, upward mobility out of poverty are all strongly linked to maternal education. What percentage of new moms report smoking during pregnancy? It's still high. 10 to 25. 10 to 25 isn't a choice. You've got to pick 10 to 15 or 15 to 20 or 20 um, to 25. 20 to 25. 25 to 30. It's actually only about, yeah, it's only about 15 to 20 percent. Um, it's about double in the, some of the indigenous populations because there's still non-traditional use, of, quite a lot of non-traditional use of tobacco. And uh, of course, it's higher in younger moms and in pregnancies under, you know, in teenage adolescent pregnancy. So, and the smoking during pregnancy is not benign, right? Like we, we kind of don't worry about it. But at a population health level, it is an important risk factor. Okay. Order the top three causes of neonatal death from highest to lowest. Uh, congenital anomalies. And then labor complications, then infection. I would not consider that the lower bridge or gestation. I, I would say something about the maternal conditions. So, which can we agree on what the what the most common the 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 
highest one is. Congenital anomalies. Yeah. yeah. So congenital anomalies accounts for about 35% of neonatal deaths. And labor complications. That makes sense. Yeah. So the next one is actually short gestation. Oh. So prematurity accounts and small babies account for about 14% of neonatal deaths. Okay. I would not say respiratory failure or less no. Oh. Infection? Infection. And then the rest of them start to get closer together. Oh. So Genital anomalies about 35%, short gestation about 14%, complications of labor about 12%, maternal complications seven, respiratory failure five, and infection four. Right? Screening and treatment for GBS has been a, you know, has is a is reduces your risk of GBS infection quite a bit. Okay. Now our little guys. What's our preterm birth rate approximately? 9.5. So it's about 7.5, 8 percent the preterm birth rate. So again, not as high as we think it is. <laughs> and shockingly, not shockingly, highly affected by sociodemographics and um, uh, indigenous status, right? So again, First Nations folks much more likely to have preterm births. Um, across your different health regions, there are some discrepancies because there's some kind of general socio-demographic differences across the different health regions. Um, and one of the, do you know what one of the big drivers of prematurity is in the First Nations population? So is diabetes, right? So think about one of the big drivers of, right? So like mo the, the, we're gonna have a question later on about how many preterm births or late preterm births, right? But late preterm births make up the bulk of premature deliveries, right? And, and if you think about how many babies, like how kids born, like moms with diabetes in pregnancy end up having preterm births, right? They end up having preterm births because um, the babies are getting gigantic. Um, uh, the risk of stillbirth goes up dramatically as you approach term, which is why they induce them, ideally not preterm, but certainly like early term. Um, and so that's a huge driver of late prematurity, as is multiple births, right? So like I know for Northern Health, usually like if they think the mom is going to deliver early or have any kind of complications, they do try to send them to the city. So looking at this, are this they, is where they live. Where they live. Okay. Yeah, not where they're born. But I mean, if they're above 33 weeks, they'll deliver them in Thompson, right? Like Thompson has it does a does a brisk business in. Like, well, and I know the pa used to have a, like a really they were busy too. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. So this yeah, this is by where they live, not where they deliver. Okay. But yes, the chance of having to go out of your health region to deliver is way higher in the north and way higher in uh, folks living with diabetes. So, how much higher is the risk of preterm birth at the lowest? Compared to the highest income quintile, so if we take the population, take the income, take the, the so this is using area level income. So a lot of statistical research uses area level income. So it goes down to your six digit postal code, and then from the census we know that the income, average income of that postal code, and so that's called the dissemination area. And then we can we can assign an income quint we can assign an income quintile to that area. It sounds like it shouldn't work, but it actually does really well because it really doesn't like it, it really doesn't matter exactly like people live in general areas. Right. How much higher? 30%. So the difference between the highest and the lowest. So yeah, the difference between the, the so the first income quintile is the lowest income quintile and the top income quintile is income quintile five. The difference yeah, what's the diff what's the how much higher is the is the birth rate? Is the preterm birth rate in the highest quintile? Okay. So well, we said we said seven point was it seven point five percent? That's 
this is relative increase, okay. not the actual number. Oh, not that number. Like if the number is if the number just for ease of math is one in the in the in the in the in the highest quintile, what would it be in the lowest quintile? One point three. Yeah, so it's 30%. Mm -hmm. So it's 30% higher in your lowest point. Yeah, so again, right? Those babies are more likely to end up here. And then once once they're here, they're the same. But then once they go home, they're all right. So it's like it's a it's like a ballooning of risk. So then we have to get to this idea of population attributable risk or etiologic fraction. So it's this idea that um the, the, imp the impact that something has at a population level is affected both by how bad something is and by how many people are affected by it. So if something's really, really bad, but it only affects two people, at the population level, it's not going to have a huge impact, right? But if something's kind of only mildly bad, but it affects 60% of the population, it's going to have a huge, much larger impact on the population at large. And so... Um, Pat Martins, who was the director of MCHP, where a whole bunch of these stats come from before me, she talked about the shift and switch. So when we talk about the like normal distribution of something in the population, right? So we talk about the distribution of preterm birth across the population. What we can do, we're not going to be able to like bring something down, but if we narrow the distribution and move it a little bit better, then everybody gets better. Right, or if we talk about managing managing the so the last one of the last projects we did was on diabetes, type two diabetes in Manitoba, and the like distribution of A one Cs, which is how we measure diabetes control, is like wide and bad. And so, but right, we don't have to make everybody's perfect. But at the population level, if we made the distribution narrower and just made everything a little better, then our population health would get a lot better. Right? It's like we don't need to eliminate poverty, but if we got everybody a little bit more money. And we can, at a population level, have a better difference. I could not read a poverty. You want to be a better well, person. yes. I got myself in trouble once. I was at a working group on infant mortality, and there was someone from mental health sitting at my table, and I said, you know, in a, in a country with a social safety net, the government decides how many children live in poverty, and she didn't like that. And it's true. But it's very true. It's very true. And they've proven, so uh, the government has a program that they haven't increased the funding on in years. Um, it's the Healthy Child Benefit. And so if you meet the criteria, you and you're pregnant, you get something like $250 a month, just here, have $250 a month. And they actually showed that it reduced prematurity and reduced low birth weight babies. It doesn't anymore because they haven't increased it and it's like not enough money anymore. But like this idea that we have this like complicated system of fixing things, whereas the answer to poverty is money. Absolutely. And folks will spend the money on things that they need to spend the money on. It's not Right? It's not our job to police how people spend their money. Yes, some people will spend it on drugs and alcohol, but most people don't. And those people who do need assistance even more because they need assistance to, get off to, to help them to make the choices to keep themselves healthy. But yes. So or deal with the problem that brings them to those things. Correct. I've been on court question where you said narrowing it. How about bringing it down, flattening it, as opposed to narrowing it? Oh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not talking about but we're talking about like moving the proportion of the numbers over, right? So if, the, if, if dropping it isn't dropping it, dropping it is the number of folks, right? Mm -hmm. So that the, the number of folks goes up the y axis yeah. and the severity goes across the x. So I, what I want to do is actually make it really narrow mm -hmm. and move it over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about. Making everybody's outcome a little better and clustering them all around that better outcome instead of oh, having two tails. Oh, I, I was thinking maybe prevalence of bad outcome. No, no, no. I'm talking about when some when something has a distribution from the good to the bad goes from oh. left to right. I want to move everyone over to the left and I want to cluster them over here. She used to make everybody stand up and do this shit. It's good. Anyways, she was hilarious. Okay. Anyways, yeah. So now some population of trivial risks about prematurity, and then we're gonna. What percentage of live-born infants are born at 34 to 36 weeks? 7.6%. So that was our preterm birth rate. Yeah, and uh, 4.9. Oh, yeah. I'm just cute. Yeah, so about 5%, right? It's about 
It's about three quarters of preterm infants are born late preterm. What is the relative risk? So we're talking about early neonatal death, so death in the first week, for late preterm infants compared to term infants. So term is our reference range here. 1.6. That is 1.1. So how much more likely is a late preterm infant to die than a term infant? 2.3 to 2.3. Yeah, I think it's 2.3. They do well. So it's actually 7.9. Oh my goodness. Well, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Regardless of birth weight. I was going to say 2.3. Just, though, this is just by gestational age. But yeah, that makes sense. So their crude risk is 6.9 per thousand. So 6.9 babies will die per thousand. Because remember what we talked about, what's the most likely reason why kids die for neonatal deaths? Congenital anomalies. Babies with congenital anomalies are substantially more likely to be born late preterm. So that's why the, num that's why the number, you're not thinking, when you think about a late preterm baby, you're not thinking about a kid with a congenital anomaly. If we, ex if we exclude kids with congenital anomalies, their crude risk is only 2.2 .2 okay. per thousand. Okay. So that's where your two and your 1.7 is, right? Yeah. Because you're just you're you're ex, you have naturally excluded kids with congenital anomalies. So when we talk about risk factors for congenital anomalies, we have to remember that it's probably not that being born preterm makes you more likely to have a cleft lip and palate. It's that if you have a cleft lip and palate, you're more likely to be born preterm, right? Or if you have diabetes, you're more likely to be born preterm. But if you have diabetes, like pre-existing diabetes in pregnancy, you're also more likely to have congenital anomalies, right? So like it all travels together. <laughs> what percentage of live born infants are born at less than 28 weeks? It's our bread and butter. <laughs> See. <laughs> it's 0.4 percent. So of oh, okay. so that's of all live born all infants, born, right? Born it's about just over 3% of preterms are born less than 28 weeks. But again, that's our bread and butter, so we remember all those babies. So it's actually not that many babies. No. Like think about how many, so these are epic babies, right? Yeah. Kind of, I think epic babies are under 29, but anyways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's actually numerically not that many babies. No, because we get like what, about 55 a year here? Yeah. 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 And but there are 17,000 that are born a year. Like. Yeah, so you think about it, it's actually not that many babies. What's the contribution of preterm birth at less than 28 weeks to early neonatal, early neonatal mortality? So how much of the mortality under a week of age is from kiddos under 28 weeks? 75 <laughs> Remember, we already said that 30% of it is from congenital anomalies. 35% yeah. of it is from congenital anomalies. I mean, and occasionally you'll have a 27 weeker with a congenital anomaly, but. I would go with 45%. Ding, 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 45%. Oh, really? Their relative risk is 496, though. So a 28 weeker is 496 times more likely to die than a term baby. <laughs> right? So this is when we start to get into kind of ludicrous numbers. But if you think about it, right? And this is kids under 28. Right? And so this includes it depends where you're born and what services are available, blah blah blah. Yeah. But it also I mean it is it also right. So and again, we all know that like a 27 weeker is way less likely to die than a 24 weeker than a 22 weeker. But again, if we just lump them all together, their relative risk is 496. Which gestational age group costs the medical system the most money? 31, 32, because they are the hugest number of preterm babies. Per, no, per, per, Not per baby. Oh. The entire healthcare system. I'm going to say uh, the, the, the birth and initial hospital stay healthcare system, not like after they go home, like not ongoing services. Hmm. I'm going to say I'm going to stick with C. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually D. Oh, 
Yeah, because there's so many of them. <laughs> they're individually cheap, but they're the vast majority of babies, right? And then some of them will be in the nursery, right? 37 weekers are more likely to be admitted than 38 weekers. Yeah. And yeah, and so, so yeah. I was thinking more than 34, 35. But yeah, the yeah. There's, just, there's just not enough of them, right? Because there's, you know, there's 17,000 babies, we said, and 5% of them. So that's still only 800 babies. Just the amount of, just the amount of, like, think about it. That's the people we're having trouble staffing right now yes. are well babies, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. So these are old stats, and I think they're American stats, but like 25, 26 weekers, 75.7 million. B, 71.8, C, 82.5. So you were right in that the 34 to the 35 weekers of the preterms cost yeah. the most money. But the term in this one was 139.9, and just because there's just so many of them. So we talked a little bit, we're almost done. We talked a little bit about SES. So SES, socioeconomic status, is a construct, right? It's this idea that we make up about that kind of gets at this idea of material standing and the societal benefit that comes from material standing, right? And it, it's, it's measured by looking at things like maternal education, family income, employment status. As a proxy measure, we can use things like a uh, number of single parent households, um, social isolation. Those are some things that are available on this Canadian census from the long form census. Um, we can measure it for research purposes at the individual or area level. So um, individual level um, SES data is a little harder to come by, especially in, at the population level, just because we don't, we don't gather it. Um, when we're talking to families and assessing socioeconomic status as a risk, certainly we can get at their idea of their, of their individual level of SES. What SES is not, we talk a little bit about is it's actually not your race or cultural group is not, it's linked to SES and it's like caught up in SES. Um, for indigenous folks, we also talk about the indigenous determinants of health, which are a little bit, which are separate from the social determinants of health. And they're things like access to traditional lands, traditional languages, like self-control of your, of your community, um, lack of colonialization. <laughs> Um, and uh, like control of your finances and your educational system, um, traditional foods, things like that. Um, it's also not area of residence per se, right? Like we know some areas are have have a lower have a higher poverty level than other areas, but you know just because you live in the northern health region doesn't mean that your SES should theoretically be worse than if you live in the southern health region. No, because if you live in the pod, then you have like industry and things there, so you're not as poor as we are. We know that for PREMS, um, the influence of the standard medical complications that we talk about, their influence decreases over childhood as the socioeconomic factors come into play. And SES has our kind of the most pronounced effect on things like verbal reasoning, executive function, language skills, and academic skills. So we know that, that preterm infants, like low SES term infants, can have some of the same outcomes as high SES preterm infants because of the detrimental effect of SES. They get a maturational lag in brain development. Um, and we, but we, the kind of flip side is that we know that providing early intervention and providing enriched environments can significantly improve outcome. So providing, you know, good educational services, good daycare, income support, stable housing, stable food supply can significantly, and providing people with the ability, with the, with the tools to look after their children can improve our outcomes. And even with evidence of brain injury, so right, so like a, a kiddo, like a, a 25 weaker that has a periventricular hemorrhagic infarction is going to be at risk of severe neurodevelopmental impairment, regardless of where they go home to, right? But their outcome will be better if they go to a higher SES home. Your 25 weaker that has, and, and even, um, even in kids with IVH and PVL, so this German study looked, they did a huge regression. 
They lumped all grades of IVH together, but when they looked at predictors of poor outcome at 10 to 13 years of age, SES beat out IVH and then beat out PVL. So it, it, it's, it's, again, I'm not saying that if we, you know, we send a baby home with a really bad head to River Heights that they're gonna do well, but they will do substantially better. And like the amount of difference that a, a good SES environment can make is pretty, pretty impressive. In Australia, socioeconomic status accounted for half a standard deviation in outcomes. And again, for an individual baby that might not necessarily, like that baby is gonna be wherever that baby is gonna be, but at the population level, the answer to a whole bunch of things is to address poverty and education. Um, term low SES equivalent outcomes to high SES ELGA infants for IQ. So you're even our really little kiddos, a, ter a, a term infant living in poverty is gonna have equivalent IQ outcomes to a high SES infant. And in, when we compare, you know, low SES ELGA infants to high SES LE, LE, ELGA infants, you get two standard deviations in IQ, which is how we define a poor neurodevelopmental outcome in, an, in, in a, in a preterm infant. So we need to do... <laughs> so how are we going to change things, Joe? So how do we change things? We advocate for our patients to get all of the services that they can get. You know, we advocate with government. I mean, the, the, the thing is, is we provide the best that we can for our babies and we make sure that our families get all the support that they can get. There are a lot of supports out there for low SES families. So we need to make sure that, that they can get the support that they need. And we need to, you know, we need to kind of talk to families about the importance of accessing, right? The highest development, pro the highest follow-up program helps folks up. The, the good thing is, is that we know that small improvements in intervention can improve outcomes. So, and, you know, if we advocate for services, you know, we advocate, so there's, there's push of the government for universal basic income, stable housing, like all of the things we vote for people that will, that will address the system. Chelsea, I wrote something in the chat. Can you? Oh yeah, I can't see the chat. Sorry, because it's I don't know. It's here. I'm gonna okay, start stop. Want me to read it, or can you access it now that you're not? I'm trying. Okay. Did I stop? No, I don't want to leave meeting. Stop. Did I stop sharing? Oh yeah, nope. you stopped. Oh, here we go. I'm sure. Oh look, sorry, Iman's been guessing, but I couldn't. I couldn't see. Sheree has a question related to income, medical resources. <laughs> <laughs> relevant, yes, um, is uh, that, I mean, the problem is, is that the problem and the solution is that we can make small changes by reaching out to areas that are underserviced um, from a medical point of view, but the answer to getting rid of the um, issues with the discrepancy once the babies go home is addressing poverty. And the thing is, is if you address poverty, you address everything. If you address poverty, you address justice, you address, right? You address, you give people more tools to deal with all of the other microaggressions in their world, right? Like they say money, money can't buy happiness, but it, but you need a certain amount of money to get to a certain, like to get to an entry level, right? Like if I'm worried about where my next meal is coming from or where I'm gonna sleep tonight, I can't, I don't, right? I don't have any money. I don't have anything to deal with anything else. I don't have the- You're not worrying about am I going to take my medication because it's not right, on your list. Right, it's not on your list, right? Like they've done some really good stuff that they've shown that like you can provide like historically and like, so for those of you that came to Heather Watson's discussion about, about um, harm reduction, like for substance involved folks, we make them be dry or clean before we help them but we don't do that in anything else, right? Like they've shown that for one of the best ways to improve mental health outcomes and substance health outcomes is to give people stable housing, right? Because again, it's, it's about like, if I have nowhere to live, then I can't keep my possessions. I can't keep my, right? I have nowhere to put my stuff. I don't know where I'm gonna live. Services you, have no you can't get any services, especially, especially for women and trans folks. You end up in becoming involved in sex work because that, because it, like, it's just this, it's this like, or you know you stay in relationships, unhealthy relationships because at least you have somewhere to sleep, right? And it's this like ballooning. So when we talk about a thorny problem, we talk about fix, picking one thing that we can address, right? And so one thing that we can address is to, you know, is to be aware of the resources that are in place for the folks that we see. And for us, luckily, we have social work. 
<laughs> to help us with that. Social work, Indigenous health now, like we have the yeah. yeah. we have services. Yeah. Okay. So I have a question. I don't know how to even put some question. <laughs> like, what is the proportion of a policymaker, like in terms of um in in terms of proportion uh, percentage of the indigenous people and the other non-indigenous people like representation in, in policy? In policy well it depends what you're talking about so in the government health it's policy okay. in health policy making mm -hmm. not in first nations communities it's pretty low first nations communities there is a return of health care provision back to first nations communities um, so for some First Nations communities, they are in control of their own, but like the representation of Indigenous folks in the healthcare system, in the non-community-based healthcare system is very low. Um, and I mean, that's a problem. Uh, and, and for sure. I mean, I think it's getting better, right? We, and like help, like, you know, like we know that if you receive healthcare from somebody from a cultural group that you identify with, your outcomes are better, right? So you have to be able to trust who you're getting your healthcare. Yeah, 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 and, and yeah, and so we know that like the availability of you know non-white practitioners in general is low. Um, I mean, again, it's getting better. It takes time, but yeah, no, it's so, and it's an interesting process. My friend is the lead of Kenora is in Treaty Three, and she's the lead of healthcare transformation for the Treaty Three Grand Council, and they are currently again just. They're, they're building an all-nations hospital, and they are essentially transforming the way they deliver healthcare in Kenora, and the, in the health region that is Kenora, right? And so, and all-nations includes non-Indigenous folks, right? Like, it's, yeah. it's not just a first-nations hospital. It's they're essentially, and by, by partnering with and involving in all stages the Indigenous communities around Kenora, with the hope that they can create a healthcare system to serve the needs of the vast population. Yeah. And the surrounding area. Because if you take care of like the ones that are, you know, on the lowest level, you bring everyone else up, right? Like you, you include everyone. So smart. And imagine the work that's involved in that. Too. Yeah, it's uh, and the mind shift of it. Yeah. Fighting with the old guard. Any other questions? Thanks for listening. We have disorders of sexual differentiation in 15 minutes. <laughs> But yeah, okay, thanks all. Sorry I couldn't see the chat. <laughs>